So our first question for our panelists, um, we have three lovely ladies here with us today and I will just go ahead and let them introduce themselves. And then I'll ask the big first question after your introduction. So if y'all wanna go ahead with that, that'd be great. I guess I can go first. <laughs> um, my name is Philippia Satterwhite. Uh, I am the coordinator for um, financial wellness and education um, within One Stop. Um, and so I've been working at UT um, for about 10 years now. And so I have a lot of experience in higher education and um, looking for jobs and thinking about jobs and being on both sides of um, that conversation. Hi, so I'm Lexi Walker. I work in our visitor center, so in the student union on the second floor. I'm the academic outreach coordinator, so I plan prospective student visits. When a student comes on a tour and they want to meet with arts and sciences or with engineering or business, I set up those additional appointments. Um, I've been working for UT. It'll be a year tomorrow, but I've been working in higher education for about three years now. Hi everyone, I'm Megan Flora and I work in the Housing College of Business. I'm the Employer Development Manager. So I work on the undergraduate side working with companies who come to campus to recruit across all the majors. Um, and I have been in my role right around a year and a half. I started in fall of 2018 um, and been in higher ed for about seven or eight years now. So excited to be here tonight. Thank you. Awesome. And we have one more panelist who unfortunately couldn't be with us today, but she is here with us virtually. Um, she recorded some videos, so I will be sharing my screen and showing those throughout as much as possible um, where, where we can. Um, but her name is Alicia Price, and she works um, with a coalition in Anderson County. And um, so we'll definitely hear more from her. Um, and then just to make sure I didn't miss anything with our first question, um, I know y'all answered what you do for work and your connection to UT, um, but what are you involved with both at work and outside of work? I'll start, um, I, I'll start with work, I guess. Um, so as part of my role, a lot of what I'm involved is involved in um, student planning. I also travel quite a bit to go and do employer site visits, um, which I love because I enjoy traveling just as a hobby. So it's nice to have that kind of intertwined into my work. Um, I also do quite a few professional development groups through the college as well. We have a great diversity office and they um, do events throughout the year for College of Business students and staff. Um, I mean, last month, for example, we had a women in leadership conference that we were able to go to. Um, so I try to get involved with things outside of my job function at work just to kind of help meet people and, and engage across the college. Um, outside of work, I am involved in a few different meetup groups around the city, um, a couple of hiking ones. Um, I'm also in the Knoxville Professionals Network, which is actually how I met Lexi on here. Um, and we are both on the social committee, so we help plan just monthly happy, happy hours for our team members. Um, I also enjoy, like I said, just kind of getting outdoors, the travel piece. Um, and then even though I've been in Knoxville for a year and a half now, I'm still kind of digging away and um, kind of finding new, new groups to join and just still working to kind of find that community here and create that. Awesome. Um, oh, you can go. No, go ahead, Lexi. Okay. Awesome. Um, so like Megan said, I'll start kind of with outside of work. I'm also involved with YPK, which is the Young Professionals of Knoxville. And um, it's a really great way of kind of getting to know a new city if there's a professional organization hopping into one. So YPK is a really great way to meet other young professionals and um, joining the social committee was great to kind of learn Knoxville a little bit more as well as help kind of other young professionals are Knoxville. 
as far as being involved kind of on campus and in campus life. So within my role, I work um, with the tour programs, but one thing I really enjoy is working with academic departments. So um, I have a lot of outreach through different um, department contacts, um, working with the honors and scholars programs, working with undergraduate programs that deal with prospective students. And then I also co-host with um, Michael Smith Porter, the sounding board for young professionals, which is just a lunch that is housed once a month to help uh, other professionals around UT's campus kind of um, plug into the other resources that campus holds. I um I will start with well you know we do outside at UT um, like Megan I also love to travel one of the things about being in higher education is that you just need a network of people and you always have a place so if you're going to some city you're like hey who I know here um, it's all, so it's always great to meet people through um, just those connections. So I, so I love to travel and seeing cities and um, meeting new people. And so that's what one of the things I like about working at UT is because one of my job as the financial wellness coordinator is that I get to meet with different departments and seeing where we can make connections and how we can kind of work together to kind of bring certain kind of um, programming to campus or, or to different parts of campus. And so I, um, I feel like connections are always important to me, both inside UT and outside UT. And so um, that's kind of how I do some of my time beyond just, uh, I also love games. I'm part of a couple of like gaming groups and we kind of meet once a month and we play games. And so I try to also do that with my office. Right now we're talking about having a game night of our own. And so, um, so again, I just, you know, uh, just a lot of just building connections. Awesome. And we are going to meet Alicia um, with some of the videos that she shared with us as well. Hi there. My name is Alicia Price, and I serve as the current policy coordinator at the Department of Education. I would like to hand over to Renee, but I told Megan that I'd be happy to leave if she needs to take care of it. Hey, guys, it's Haley from UT. Um, this says uh, this was involved in both out work and outside of work. Um, so in my current role at East Africa Anderson, our mission is to prevent and reduce substance use in Anderson County. So we work with different organizations all across Anderson County to ultimately find different paths for folks to not pick up substances in the first place, focusing on alcohol, tobacco. Um, and anything opioid or prescription drug or non-prescription drug. Um, so, as you know, perhaps right now there is one piece of big crisis, so my work takes me a lot of different places, from school systems, law enforcement, agencies, to local businesses. Um, I have the opportunity to engage with quite a different population, um, depending on what I'm doing for the day. But the things that I have done outside of work um, have looked a little bit different over the years. So. Uh, currently, I'm second elect for the board for the program of Run and Fair Hospital. On top of that, I serve on the board for the Young Professionals of Anderson County. So, you know, I live in Knoxville. My primary role is in Anderson County. Uh, I recently rolled off as the chair of the Leadership and Professional Development Committee for the United Way Young Leaders Society. And in the past, I've done a few different things, uh, one of which was serve on the UT Young Alumni Council. I was the campus relations chair. <laughs> and have also served as the brothers and sisters and the junior of the hospital. I think that is it for quick oh, And then also for question one, it says, what is your connection with the University of Tennessee? So I am a two-time alum from UT, so my bachelor's degree is in biological sciences with computational and microbiology, and then my master's degree is in higher education administration. And prior to this role in the world before this for me professionally, I worked at the University of Tennessee Center for Leadership and Service, uh, working with the Leadership and Scholars Program at the University. So it's now the Jones Center for Leadership and Service, and I hope you're involved with it while you're there. Awesome. So for our second question, what brought you to Knoxville and what was your transition like? I'll go first for this one. So um, after graduating, I actually transitioned full-time into working for the University of Oklahoma, 
which is my undergraduate institution. And I worked there for about a year and a half. Um, and I was just kind of looking for a similar role with maybe a little bit different structuring for other opportunities. So when I was looking at institutions, UT kind of just popped up on my radar um, because there was an opening in the visitor center and I had worked in the visitor center and I really enjoy kind of the innovation and opportunities that are available through higher education. So I applied for the position um, higher ed works sometimes a little bit slower, uh, so I applied for that position in November, um, and then February I got a call um, about a possible interview. I flew down. Uh, that did not quite go as planned. I was supposed to get in at six. I got in. Um, I was delayed by eight hours, and so I got in about in the middle of the night. Um, that next day, it was in the middle of the February storm, so I was flying out at seven after my interview at two. I had planned to explore the city a little bit. I was not doing that in the rain and dress clothing, so I had my interview. Um, things went really well ended up getting the position. And then the way uh, I was within my current office, it wasn't feasible to come back down to Knoxville before starting. So I looked online, I got an apartment sight unseen. I ordered my furniture from Ashley Home Furniture through text message. So if you guys are ever looking for a place and need furniture, you can text a representative from there and they'll pick out furniture for you. Just a fun tip. Um, and so I, luckily on my furniture fit, I also did not measure the apartment, which was probably something I should have done. Um, I had my last day on a Wednesday. I packed up the car. Um, I had kind of a going away thing on that Friday. Uh, we left Norman on a Saturday, got into Knoxville on Sunday, and then I started work on that Monday. So it was a really quick transition. Um, I don't know if I would have done it differently. It was fast, but I think that it was the right fit for me. I like to kind of keep going and going and going. So the transition from stopping and starting again worked really well into my plan. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily though recommend cross country in like four days. Uh, it was a little nerve wracking until we got here, but it's been great since. <laughs> Um, so actually, I grew up in Knoxville, um, but I moved away to go to college and had no plans of ever coming back to Knoxville because I'm like, that's, I've been there, done that, I don't need to ever be in Knoxville again. Um, and I lived in D.C. for a while, lived in Kentucky, um, and then eventually I did come back home uh, and I moved in with my parents. And also, D.C., I'm sorry, Knoxville had changed so much. Um, and the time I was gone. So it was really like moving into another, a new city. And so trying to figure out kind of all the, like, you know, the changes that are downtown. And so I, so I came and got a, uh, I moved in with my parents. So I was like, I was like, I hate Kentucky or at least a little was happening while I was there. And so I moved in with my parents and then I got a tip job actually with the University of Tennessee. And so I was um, in a tip position for a bit and so I applied to a number of jobs across campus um, and then was able to, to get a job actually in the office I was in and then um, once one stop opened I was able to apply for that position um, and started working there um, and so but in that in that meantime I was like I said trying to you know because all the people I knew were from high school and I didn't really keep in contact with them and so trying to navigate the city and all the changes was really an interesting experience given that I thought I knew Knoxville when I when I left and so um and so I think that that transition but it was pretty smooth I think I think because I, I you know still had my family here as like this kind of supportive network but also I was able to meet people um through just new and different ways um that I hadn't had ever done before and so I think that helped kind of build up a network of people to kind of provide support. So that's kind of like my transition. And I ended up in Knoxville kind of around about way I feel like my whole post college life has been a little bit roundabout. So I'm from North Carolina originally. So I was um, in college in Chapel Hill and was a typical college student had no idea what I wanted to do after I finished or and I really didn't think that much about it. Um, so when I graduated, 
I had about four years of just kind of random odd jobs and trying to figure out, I should have thought about it all much, much sooner. So that's my first piece of advice. But um, so, I mean, I worked everything from moving back home and working for my dad for a while. And then I moved to California for a while and worked for an astronomy camp for a while. So, I mean, one extreme to the other. So long story short, did that for about four years and then discovered that higher ed was a thing um, and get, went, ended up going back to Appalachian State in Boone, North Carolina to get my grad degree in student affairs and college student development. Um, when I finished that program, I was very open as far as where I wanted to go next. So I applied at places all over the country because I just wanted to go somewhere I had not been and was very open. So a friend of mine that I knew down in Athens, Georgia, um, had there was an opening at University of Georgia down there, and she said, hey, you should apply. I first kind of wrote it off because I wasn't interested in going to Georgia at all. I was like, oh, I don't know, but I applied on a whim, and truly two weeks later, I started Lexi, very similar to you. I packed my stuff, drove down to Athens on Friday, drove around town on Saturday looking for a place to live, my movers came Sunday and I started on Monday. Um, and I ended up staying down there for a little over six years. So I worked at the career center there, um, working with business students doing career counseling. Loved it, had a wonderful experience, had wonderful people that I worked with. Um, but I got to the point where I was getting, just ready for the next thing. I was getting a little bit bored, I guess, in my role. Um, so I was putting a few feelers out and again, I was pretty open to kind of going anywhere in the country and same thing happened. A friend of mine that I knew through, I had met through my work at UGA, had a connection here in Knoxville and said, Hey, you should look in Knoxville. You should just kind of see what you, what you think of it. And again, Knoxville was never on my radar at all, but I ended up coming up and doing a few informational interviews with a few folks and kind of saw the city and just really fell in love with it from the first time I was up here. Um, so ended up applying for my current role and ended up getting it, which was, I was so excited about. Um, so I came up here about a year and a half ago and my transition was pretty typical in the good and the bad ways. I mean, it was just me moving. And so this was my first big move where I didn't have any help because unfortunately the friends I had in the area were all out of town on trips because I moved over the summer. Um, and all of my family members that were in North Carolina had conflicts as well. So that was probably the most overwhelming part is just the actual process of moving, getting from point A to point B, and then all the stuff that comes after. So even figuring out where do I get my license and I need to find a bank and I need to figure out how to drive to work without getting lost and where do I park on the first day and a lot of those little things that come with any transition made it tricky um, but I immediately thought at home here um, as I mean you all probably feel similarly that you know Knoxville is a very friendly city and everyone especially at UT on campus, everyone has been so friendly. So overall, the transition was smooth, but just the usual kind of hiccups that come with moving your life from where you've been to your new place where you don't know anyone and don't know anything about anything. Awesome. And then we'll get Alicia's answer as well. is what brought you to Knoxville and what was your transition like? Um, in full transparency, I did not grow up terribly far away from Knoxville. Um, I grew up in Morristown, Tennessee, which is about 25 minutes from Knoxville. Um, up here. So any weekend I generally spend going either shopping or doing something, I spent in Knoxville. But um, I was truly from more um, upper East Tennessee. So the transition itself was not terribly hard um, because not only did I transition to Knoxville, my family being only 45 minutes away, I also transitioned with my now husband. So um, for me, it was more about figuring out how to get plugged into the community because even though I had spent a lot of time in Knoxville in kind of like a social capacity, I didn't necessarily understand what it meant to serve the community. Um, and now also being in Anderson County, I think it's just a bit of research and figuring out what, what really are some of the areas of need um, for the community and then also discovering like 
what do I enjoy? What do I just want to go and get involved in? It's a little bit of networking and trial and error and seeing what ultimately makes sense. But for me, the transition was really, really very extreme. All right. And for our next question, did you find, what did you find challenging about navigating a job search? I'll be glad to um, or, oh, go ahead. Um, I think for me, the most challenging part was just navigating the unknown of a job search in the sense of not knowing how the interview's going to go or if you're even going to get the job or if it's in a place that you've never been, am I going to like that location? Am I going to like the people I work with? Do I even want this job enough to be going through the whole process? And I'm naturally just such a planner that it's especially hard to kind of have to move forward without having all of the information. Um, but now that I've gone through a handful of job searches in my own career, I think what I finally learned is that you just have to be okay with not knowing everything and feeling like you can make you have to just use the information you have at the moment to make the most informed decision that you can. And you just have to trust that it will kind of all work out. And even if it doesn't work out the way you hope, kind of just knowing that sometimes that's okay. And that if you don't get your initial job that you're hoping for, you just never quite know what's gonna be around the corner. Um, I know I've certainly had a couple of situations where I've been dead set on the job that I was applying for, didn't work out, and I was just crushed. But then every time that's happened, within a week or a month or even a few months afterwards, something else has come along. Um, but yeah, for me, I think it's just navigating the unknown and just not really being sure how qualified you are, or who you're up against. You just have to go in blind in some ways, but just kind of trust that you are a good candidate. And if it's, you know, if you're the best person for the job, then it'll work out. Um, I would say for me, uh, one of the challenges of the job search um, is kind of also just kind of letting go of my ego a little bit because, you know, I think, oh, I'm perfect for any job, right? I can, I can do anything. Um, and so I had a friend tell me once, I remember applied for this job that, um, was like in a business office and um was about like handling books and i was like this sounds perfect because i love where their place was and i, I love like some of the perks they had and so i was really excited about this job and a friend had to tell me she's like you have an english degree and a philosophy degree you have no background in business so i'm like i could learn it and so i had to like one let go of ego in the sense of like one, you may not hear back, right? You, you apply for jobs and you may not hear anything or you may take months to hear things back. And so not to take that, that personally, that's not a, a, a strike against you. It could just be, there's a lot of things happening uh, in a company. Like I think now, uh, like with AUT, with all the job searches where, with, the, you know, with the coronavirus and how that could slow down job searches. So there's a lot of things that could be happening in an office that have nothing to do with your application but you get so caught up because you're, you're like, I'm looking for a job. I really, you know, I'm just getting out of college or I'm about to transition to a new place and I need to make sure I have work. And it's easy to get uh, caught up in thinking that somehow it's you. I mean, just like what Megan says that, um, you know, finding the right fit is important too. Like that you, you know, that you kind of have to just, you know, um, you know, go in a little bit blind, not knowing what else is going on. But if you, you um, kind of keep at it, you'll find something that, you know, will meet what your, what your needs are. Yeah, and for me, it's kind of just summing that up too and trusting the process. I think all job searches, even if you've been through it before, they're going to be scary. Um, and so knowing that it is a new process and also knowing it's a new process for the people interviewing you, you're a new candidate to them too, which means that you have an opportunity to ask questions um, and to really figure out if that's a good fit for you, because that's also as important as you being a good fit for um, them. And so trusting that process and also knowing that it does get easier. That first job is always going to be difficult. Um, it's kind of that joke of like having to have experience, but you're also just kind of right out of college. 
after you start getting that experience, connections start happening, and there are those opportunities that pop up even when you're not really looking for them. So kind of like Megan, that's how it's worked out for me is there's just been those opportunities that have popped out and, and the job that I've been looking for after, you know, that first job, I had that experience and I was able to speak directly to it and that's what kind of gives you the edge there. So don't worry about it. I know that's a hard one because it's like you you worry about it, um, but not worrying about it and just trusting the process, I think, is the best thing for me. So the next question is, what did you find challenging about navigating the job search? So I am on my third professional role in the graduating from my master's program. And I think for me, the most challenging thing so far has been finding that position that is a good um, I'll say my husband is a PA. So for him, if he is going to look for a job, he is going to go to um, indeed.com and he's going to plug in position assistant and then things are going to auto-generate for him. I think my path has been a little more untraditional in that there's not just that simple like, okay, I have this degree, I have this set of skills, and I'm going to go do, you know, this job. So for me, it's been trying to piece them all together. Okay, what is my skill set? What are the things I'm passionate about? And then what do I ultimately want my career trajectory to be? And then trying to place my experiences with organizations that it makes sense and that I, I believe in. And so, the hardest part though is that none of the positions I have ever applied for have actually been on a job board. So for example, my first one out of grad school, I think it was posted for maybe a week online, but I had learned about it well before then and interviewed for it, I think the first day that the actual application went live. My second position, there was a never position description actually for it at all. Um, so I got a phone call from an individual who I was familiar with that said, hey, we're about to open this position in our organization. I think it'd be a really great fit for it. Send me your resume. And then I had an interview two weeks later, and then I had a job within three weeks of that. And then with my current role, I'm a little bit different because I think my job search was a little more complicated um, because the organization I'd worked for was a nonprofit that unfortunately dissolved. So I had currently been laid off and I had to find something with a fairly quick turnaround. And like I was saying, there was nothing on job boards that seemed to really make sense to me since I have a bachelor's in microbiology, a master's in higher education, and then my former role was in kind of health promotion, nonprofit coalition building, so it's very open-ended in a way. Um, but this role also kind of fell on my lap that it wasn't posted anywhere, but I had received a phone call from a friend saying, hey, this position's open. I was considering it a really a good fit for me, but I think it would be a good fit for you. And sent her my resume within 10 minutes. Got a phone call from the executive director of the place that I currently work for and interviewed on the spot. And um, we had a formal interview in person the following week and she offered me the job on the spot. So very untraditional perhaps. Um, path or way of, of getting jobs, but I think for me, it's always been about who did I know and who mm -hmm. have I built relationships with that will go on, on a limb for me to help me find something that ultimately makes sense and just want to pass my resume along and find me a position that might not necessarily be posted online. So very much sensing a theme of sometimes it's about who you know. Um, all of y'all spoke to that, um, and even I'm, I'm not sharing my questions and answers <laughs> to these questions, but very, very similar. Um, a lot of the jobs that I have had have been because of knowing people and just those connections. So, you know, definitely one big piece of advice: continue to grow that network, and and you'll continue to hear that as we as we go along. All right. So the next question: What did you find uplifting and comforting during initial searches, and how were you supported during those processes? I'll be glad to start with that one. Um, I think in my initial searches, I think something I tried to kind of think about to make it feel a little bit more comfortable 
Um, because I've always been one to get super nervous in interviews. Once I get going, I'm fine, but it's usually the anticipation and just the thinking about it over and over and over again. But I tried to start thinking about interviews more as, if nothing else, it's good practice for whatever your next interview is going to be. And I tried to get into the mindset of just thinking it, thinking of it more as a conversation of, let me practice and just get into the, the routine of things. And that was able, that helped me to be able to take some of that pressure off of myself. And I also just want to remind myself that the employers are a lot of times just as nervous as you are because you are also interviewing them. There's not a guarantee that the candidates that they're interviewing want to come to their company. So the employers are usually a little nervous as well because they want to present their best face and they want you to come work for their company. So once I started thinking about that, it's that's not one-sided, it's more two-way. Both people are nervous and both want to do a good job. It kind of even the playing field a little bit, at least in my head, that gave me some relief and took some of that pressure off. Um, I think something else I tried to keep in mind that made me feel a little bit more comfortable was that you just, you never know who you'll meet even in an interview. Um, Cause I know in higher ed, a lot of the interviews that I've gone through involve a lot of different people on campus. So it's not like you just come and you're there for an hour I've always been there all day during my interviews and meeting with sometimes up to 20 or 25 different people. And keep in mind that even if this job that you're interviewing for that day does not work out, if you've done a good job during your interview and presented yourself well, you've been exposed to all of those different people around campus and you never know what might come up. I mean, I've had an example in my own job search and then several friends of mine too have similar examples where they didn't get job one, but they interviewed so well that someone who saw them on that day followed up with them and said, hey, I heard you didn't get this role, but we actually have an opening in our office and would you be interested? Um, so just keep that in mind too, that again, even if this one job that you think is the one you really want, even if that doesn't work out, you never know who may else have noticed you that day who may also be interested in you as a candidate. Um, and then the other thing too is try to think of your job search as exciting. And I know that may seem kind of counterintuitive, but especially if it's just you, like in the case of every time I've moved, it's just been me moving. And while that is scary and overwhelming and all of those things, it's also very freeing and also very exciting to be able to just up and go to a new place, meet new people and start a new chapter of your life. Um, and especially right after college, that's probably going to be the freest time of your entire life, especially if you eventually get married or have a family, things like that. You know, the older you get, the more obligations I think you have. So keep in mind that coming right out of school, you are free as a bird in a lot of ways. And just take advantage of that and look at each job search as something that's exciting and new and kind of the first step for your next adventure. Yeah, a lot of what um, Megan say, said, I really resonate with, um, especially about like, if you don't get the job, it's not necessarily always a rejection. Um, there's a lot of time opportunities that pop up out of that. Um, but one other piece I'd like to add is that leaning on your networks is one of your best things that you can do um, to help kind of make that process a little less scary. There are a lot of people in your lives who kind of want to be involved in that process. And so just like kind of opening that up and saying like, hey, I'm moving. There's a lot of times people are like, hey, like what can I do to contribute? What can I do to help? Um, I was lucky enough to be able, I know not everyone has the opportunity to lean on their family, but I was lucky enough to be able to call my mom up and say, hey, this is the process. Um, the, here's what I'm looking at. Would you be able to come and help? And she was able to come down and help. So just whether that be friends, whether that be family, whether that be a partner, um, just leaning on those those resources that you have in your life in the time where you're kind of in transition is something that I found really helpful within that job search process. Um, I would just reiterate what both Megan and Lexi have said about, you know, uh, that process of you know, relaxing into it, look, looking at the opportunities that are possible, even if you don't get this particular job. Uh, I One thing that sticks with me that someone told me early on um, when I was looking, starting to look for work was that, you know, there is no such thing as this dream job. So to like get 
a lot, you know, they think, oh, yeah, this is going to be my dream job or that you're going to be in a particular job for 30 years. Um, and so that's really not kind of what, what the kind of job market looks like, looks like right now. And so that it's okay to look, you know, look for places where you can then build those connections and work towards maybe something you're more interested in. So you may start somewhere where you may not absolutely love everything you do, um, but there may be elements that you like and then figuring out what those are, right? Because sometimes you may think, oh, I really love doing this, or I think I'll love doing this, and you just have to do it in, actually in the work field, and you're like, oh, I don't enjoy this as much as I thought I would enjoy it. And so looking for those things that bring you some excitement about what you do, and then that, and then because the excitement that you show, it, it, it kind of resonates with other people, and then people look to you, and they say, oh, you know what, this person helped me with this, and they were, so good and so excited and so really they did a great job that it builds this network that people recognize that you do good work then that kind of builds a reputation for yourself so I think thinking about um, like that kind of having those people to help to help you kind of build up all your skills and figuring out what you like but also recognizing that you may not be in a job for more than five years and that it's and that's okay right and it may not be you know the perfect you know, job, you know, may not be the absolutely perfect job, but it's going to get you the skills you need to get to a better place. And so I kind of keep those things in mind when I'm in transition from one job to another is, that, okay, what did I take from this last job? How can I make my next job something more exciting or more in line with what my interests are? And then my interests change. And so as those change, should I, so also should the things I like doing change. And so having, um, that kind of self-reflection, I think, helps you figure out what you actually enjoy doing, and it helps you kind of narrow down um, where you're going in kind of in the long range of working. Okay. So it says, what did you find uplifting and comforting during your initial searches? Um, I think for me, it was all about the network of people that I knew. Um, I almost always had a group of people kind of rallying behind me, willing to be my reference, um, willing to do good work for me, willing to make a phone call to get me the thing that I was applying for. Um, and that was always very encouraging because I think um, that's a testament to the relationships that you build and the people that you have made through friendships and through professional relationships with. Um, so I think for me, that was incredibly helpful that I always felt like I could call a number of people and say, would you be willing to vouch for me? Would you be willing to speak about this skill set that I have? Um, do you think I'm a good fit for this? I, I did have a number of those conversations to say, hey, I'm considering this position. I found a posted here or there. I'm a little bit indifferent about it, or I don't know if I'll be a perfect fit because of X, Y, or Z. Um, and that they would shoot me straight and say, yes, I think you're perfect for that, or actually, maybe you should consider something like this, or, or why are you interested in that in the first place, and really asking some of those hard questions that I might not traditionally be able to ask myself, um, depending on what the situation is like. All right, so the next question, can you tell us about a time where you stepped outside of your comfort zone during a job search? I think I'll, I'll start with this one. So um, I think my stepping outside of my comfort zone was actually applying to UT for me specifically. Um, I loved my undergraduate institution, which I'm sure a lot of you do with UT. Um, I kind of, when I started working um, for the University of Oklahoma, that is where I thought I was going to be. I was one of those that I was like, okay, I'm staying here. I love what I do. I love being surrounded by this environment. Um, but I got a piece of advice that was like, sometimes a pot needs to be replanted. Um, and the soil is not necessarily like the best place for it. And re replanting that pot or replanting that plant is going to be the best way to kind of create some of those good opportunities for you and have growth. Um, and then just having those opportunities kind of where I'm not tied down and taking some of those opportunities um, at that time. And so looking outside of Oklahoma, um, and also I'm originally from Utah, so I had no family 
in Oklahoma. I had only family in Utah. Um, and so looking at Tennessee was like a what moment for me. Like I have no one here. It was a huge transition, um, but the position was one that I was really interested in. So taking that leap and still applying for something, even though kind of all the other elements scared me, I had to ask myself, okay, what are what's the biggest like downside that you're kind of scared to move? If that's the thing that's like the biggest downside to this, that's not a good enough reason for you not to move. Um, and so just kind of telling myself that uh, helps with that transition and making that search, but casting a wide net when y'all are job searching, I know it might seem that you have regions that you're looking at or you're trying to stay close to family, but I think that you should continue with those searches. I think that you have a long time to work. And so being happy in your position and kind of finding, even though it might not be the dream job, which I think that's true, just finding a, a good fit in other areas for you is going to be one of the most essential things because life's too short to be miserable in what you're doing. And so maybe expanding that net and applying to some areas that maybe you wouldn't think about applying beforehand or looking at different sectors that you wouldn't necessarily have thought about previously is one of the, the biggest leaps I think you can take. I was going to say, just to kind of piggyback off what you're saying, Lexi, I think for me, um, when I was in at the University of Kentucky, I, was, I had a faculty position, and I was so, because you're saying, guy, I love working with students, I love um, being in front of them, but that situation was um, untenable, and I had to leave. And so making that transition where, where it was like, okay, I have to make a choice between do I stay here? and be unhappy so I can continue to have um, these benefits and this pay or do I make a transition and without knowing, without a parachute, without knowing what's going to happen, um, relying on the support networks I have, like my family and friends. And so for me, that just letting go of something that wasn't working um, so that I can find something that was better. And I, you know, and I, and I did and that, and luckily, you know, it worked out, um, you know, but I think that um, sometimes recognizing um, kind of where you are and what's going to make you happy, like you were saying, um, is also going to be important because, you know, you don't, you spend a lot of time in an office. You spend a lot of time with your coworkers and you have to think about what your, your mental health, your, um, the things that kind of, the things that you enjoy. And so I think for me, that was a, a jump say okay well I'm gonna go back into the job market and I don't know where that's going to lead and I and so and I know I don't necessarily want to be another faculty member but I need to figure out what that looks like now what does that mean if I'm going to transition to a different type of career than I thought I would have so transitioning from like one path one career path to just a totally different one um, in higher ed was very very for me very uncomfortable but um, I, but I learned a lot in that process about who, what, I, what I enjoy, who I am as a person, what I, what I, what I can offer, what, where my, you know, where my skills are, and where my deficits are. And so, um, just kind of learning. So that being uncomfortable allowed me to learn a lot about just that part of who I am. I would definitely echo all of those um, tips and thoughts that were shared, especially with. I mean, every time. I have moved to somewhere completely new where I didn't know anyone and it was all new. Those have turned out to be some of my most wonderful experiences and ones where I've grown the most, I feel like, as a person and a professional. So, if you, you know, you get the chance to go somewhere new, just do it and put that fear aside. Um, I think something else that another example I've, I had of kind of really getting out of my comfort zone is after I had been at University of Georgia for about four years in the same role, three or four years, I was kind of getting bored with that role. I didn't want to leave the team and I didn't want to leave Athens because I still loved it. But I was, I wanted a different role or kind of wanted to be able to morph my current role into something else to include some more things that aligned with my interests and to help me continue to develop as a professional. Um, so a very dear friend of mine sat me down one day and she's like, you're gonna have to go and talk to your director because he doesn't know that you feel like this and he's not gonna know that you're feeling like this unless you go and have a conversation with him and kind of bring to the table, look, I've been here for three years now, here's what I've accomplished. 
here are some things that I would like to do. Here are some areas that I would like to grow. Otherwise, you're not going to be happy and you're going to start to get bitter and kind of be ready to go. Um, so I put off that conversation for months because I was too scared to do it. And I was getting more and more bored with my current role and more and more unhappy until finally I was like, I, need, I either need to have this conversation or I need to leave and find something else. Um, so I went and met with our director and I came with a page long, like point by point list of how I wanted the conversation to go. And I walked in there and kind of talked to him about what I'd accomplished and basically said, I really want to stay here, but here are my concerns and here are some ways that I think we can improve that because I really do want to stay. And at that time, he was very open to the conversation. I was terrified the whole time. Um, and at the end of that conversation, he was very appreciative that I shared all that with him. Nothing happened immediately, but within the next month or two, he was able to restructure some things in the office. And that's how I got my first promotion um, at University of Georgia. And it's all because I planted that seed in his mind and did it in a professional way that for me was terrifying and scary, but did it in a way that was respectful and not combative. So that's something I would always say too, don't never be afraid to kind of fight for what you want, but make sure you're doing it in a way where you've been somewhere long enough where you have something to show for what you've done and that you can show and kind of vouch for your skills and experience. Um, but if you are professional about it, you really have to be able to step up and do some of those scary things sometimes in order to be able to move forward and kind of further your career. So this question says, can you tell us about a time where you stepped outside of your comfort zone during a job search? Um, and I would say, actually, that was in my last job search before I got my current position, that um, they asked me to do a lot of things immediately on the spot. You know, for me, I'm a planner. Um, I want to be able to tailor my resume exactly to whatever experience that I'm applying for um, or that I have my name in the hat for, if I want to make sense, um, and to really think through potential questions that people might ask me um, because specifically my roles have looked different from job to job. Um, I really do have to have that time to kind of process and go, okay, what transferable skills do I have um, that are going to work or make me successful in this position because sometimes it could be a little unclear. So to give you a little history of my career path, because I think I've only vaguely mentioned them in the questions beforehand, um, my initial position I worked in the Center for Leadership and Service and did mainly leadership, volunteer, and civic engagement tech programming, but I also um, taught leadership development classes and I worked very heavily with an organization in Knoxville called Leadership Knoxville. And so from that position, I moved to the nonprofit setting when I worked with the Governor's Foundation for Health and Wellness. And that role had very little to do with leadership development and volunteer management and a lot to do with kind of public health and grassroots coalition building. Um, so our mission was to basically just elevate the health of Knoxville citizens through uh, community, sorry, physical activity, nutrition, and tobacco cessation. So really different from um, leadership and service over to the governor's foundation for health and wellness. But my current job does speak to my former job a little bit better now since I worked for the Governor's Foundation for Health and Wellness, which had that focus on kind of physical health um, over to ASAP at Anderson, which focuses on substance use prevention. So since I already had a tie to tobacco in that Governor's Foundation role, my current role also has that tie to tobacco, but also to different substances also. Um, so I think for me, the part about all of this that was stepping outside of my comfort zone was having to interview basically on the spot, right? I mean, it was very literally like a 30 minute process, which was an individual that I was very familiar with that um, thought I could be a good fit for my current role, calling me, telling me that she had been told about this position, saying that she didn't think she was a good fit for it, but if I was interested, could I send her my resume? and she would have passed it along because she, she thinks that'd be a good fit for the role and then almost immediately when i sent her my resume because i just i had it on hand so i sent it along and 
got a phone call very swiftly and then all of a sudden spent a whole hour on the phone um, <laughs> talking about how my role um, as the governor of foundation and my former experiences in the Center for Leadership and Service would translate to this position that I had just read through <laughs> about 30 minutes prior. Um, and so I think for me, to have done a little more planning. I would have really preferred to not think on the fly so much, um, knowing that the stakes were high and that, quite frankly, I did not know a lot about the opioid crisis, but I did have personal ties to it from my family and, and life experiences. Um, and so I knew I could be passionate about this work and, and I did have a background in tobacco cessation. But um, that definitely stretched me being a planner and not being able to anticipate what was coming and had to um, operate very quickly and um, an anticipated manner. All right, next question. What was the first thing you did after you received your first job offer? Were there things that you wish you had maybe considered then? I guess I just love this question because I remember this so specifically. So I was living in D.C. when I got my first kind of faculty adjunct position. And I was like, oh, I'm moving out. I'm like no longer having roommates. And I'm going to live in this really great part of D.C. that I love. And I'm like, of course I make enough money to cover the rent. And I, and I did, but I never thought about all the other expenses that went along with moving out and being on my own and, you know, paying for other things beyond just rent. And I, and I was thinking, oh, wow, I'm getting all this money. And then it was gone. And so I, uh, I wish I had thought about that more, um, like, oh, you know, thought about, okay, well, how much, you know, what is my rent? What percentage of my, of my paycheck should I be paying towards rent, right? Or, and how, you know, because I'm so used to splitting, like, utilities and food and, you know, and also I like, enjoyed going out with my friends and doing all those things. And so, uh, when I got my first job offer, I was like, oh, exciting, because I felt like now I'm going to be an adult, and so I got to live in this kind of certain area, and I got to have this certain kind of lifestyle, and not really thought about, and I, you know, I was really like literally kind of living, not even paycheck to paycheck, because it was like, oh, let me, I was using like credit cards to kind of help fill in gaps where I couldn't cover things, so I wish when I, I wish one of the things I kind of wish I'd done differently was just kind of think about um, what that really meant, like what, how far my paycheck really did stretch, even though on the outside, it seemed like on the outset, it seemed like, oh yeah, I'll be fine. Cause I, cause it's like, I don't know. So, you know, 60% of my paycheck is, is my rent. I should be fine. But I'll have 40% left to spend on like going out and doing other things. And that was a very, uh, it was a very, uh, very kind of tight time for me where I was trying to figure out like, telling my friends, like, you no, know, and I had to be like, yeah, of course, of course I can still go out. And I was using, like, credit cards and then having to pay credit card bills and also pay my rent and my utilities. So, um, so yeah, so now every time I get any raises or I get a new job, I kind of really think about, okay, well, what is this really going to cover? What am I really going to get from this paycheck? So, um, but it was exciting. I will say it was exciting moving into that apartment the first week. And I was like, I love this place. It's so great. I came in to have friends over and have dinner parties and just like, and so, and then reality struck. So um, for me, that was a very much a kind of really eye opener about just how things work once you're not really a student and having certain kind of support services in place that you don't really think about when you have like roommates or um, support from a campus. I will echo that 1000% because that was also me, my first job and, you know, my first real job out of school, it, my salary was, I mean, looking back was so low, it was nothing. And I truly was living paycheck to paycheck, but coming out of school after just having a campus job, initially it seemed like such a huge amount of money, but first of all, taxes are real, everybody. And you have no idea how much of your money is taken each month and then also to echo your point of whenever you get a raise also don't be fooled by that number either because it's usually not as much as it sounds initially um i will never forget the first raise i ever got when i was in georgia i don't remember if it was a certain percentage if or, or if it was a certain you know my salary is going to go from here to here but it seemed like such a huge amount to me. And I was so pumped. So I like went out 
and went out to dinner and, you know, had all these people over and was doing all this stuff before I even got my raise. And then it turned out that I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. I figured out it was an extra $7 a month. And that was all that came from my initial raise that when I first saw it seemed like such a huge thing. So for me, that was one of the more startling and more depressing things of kind of becoming an adult is realizing that your paycheck doesn't go quite as far, a lot of times, at least initially, as you hope that it will. Um, but it does get better. Obviously, you get raises as you go on. Um, and the other thing that I wish I'd been kind of wrapped my mind around a little bit more um, after my first job offer is just being okay and knowing that everything's not going to be perfect initially with your first transition because it is it's hard whether you are you know graduates whether y'all are staying in Knoxville initially or if you're going somewhere else no matter what your transition is it is hard because it's a transition and you are going from being a college student to a professional in the working world and it, it's a lot of I think it's a lot harder than some people think it will be because it is just very different so I wish I had been okay with the fact that it was going to be hard because I think in my head I just thought oh it's the next thing I'm doing it's fine I transitioned to college and it was fine so this will be the same it is very different so I wish I had just kind of thought more about that and had that in my head because I was just surprised for me personally that it was harder than I thought it would be. But looking back, it's like, obviously it's hard because it's such a different thing, but I would have just been more, more mindful of that, I think. Um, for me, when I thought of that question, I thought about like initially like that first job offer. And I think the thing that I wish I'd done is I think with the first job, especially you just want to take it um, without kind of considering that you do have the option of saying, thank you so much for like your offer. Can I consider it, you know, for a couple days? That's never gonna be an issue with your employer. And so take those couple days, even if you know for sure that you're going to be taking that job, because that couple days gives you a chance to look actually more into their policies. So looking at what is for insurance, you know, and figuring out some of those things. So if you can come back and ask some of those questions that you maybe didn't think of before, um, before you actually kind of take that job offer. So knowing that you don't have to take it immediately and that you have this time to figure out some of those things before you jump right into that first job. question is what was the first thing you did after you received your first job offer um, and were there things you wish you had considered then um, first thing I did after I got my first job offer um, was call my family and tell them that I got it and that I was incredibly excited um, I will say though that um, because I had been working as a graduate assistant in the office that I received the full-time employment offer in um, initially it was not a huge surprise to me. So if anything, I think I would have been more shocked if I hadn't got it. Because I don't think they were wanting to take me through that interview process of not ultimately offering me the position at the end of the day. Um, but I think I was incredibly excited about it. And it says, were there things you wish you had considered then? Um, no, I think the first job that I had was a really incredible opportunity for me. I think the the networking and the people that I got to meet through my role with the Leadership Knoxville Scholars Program set me up so well to do the work that I'm currently doing. And in fact, I don't know if I would have had the career trajectory I had at all had I not had that position. So I have no regret um, whatsoever for my first job offer and the process that unrolled after that. Um, for me, it was like I kind of knew what the salary was because the salary was already set. Um, I knew who my supervisor was going to be because she was already my supervisor. And so I, I understood those dynamics and um, I felt like I had an opportunity to a lifetime to build a program from scratch and to engage with very high level community leaders and, and learn from them, quite frankly. So um, nothing I would change. I felt very fortunate for my first position. All right, we have a few more questions. So thank y'all for bearing with us. What do you do to take care of yourself working in your current role? 
I think for me, uh, finding people within my like network, um, either within my office or around campus that have kind of similar hobbies, a uh, work-life balance, you think that you've got a hold of it, you don't. Uh, so figuring out kind of just how you manage the day and knowing that there's time to have fun, like you can kind of like take some of those fun times in your role. So for me, it's coffee. Um, I live at Starbucks, but partially uh, in addition to that, I just like the walk. Um, I like to get up, go with some people from my office, occasionally meet up for coffee from others around campus to kind of get out of my little nook and experience um, being a part of UT campus. And so that's kind of my mental break that I take. And then also knowing that it's okay not to take your work home with you. I think a lot of times that we were told, you know, especially in the first position, you say yes to almost everything, um, but you need to take kind of those beats for yourself. And so if you have to work on a project, that's fine, but don't have that be kind of a regular thing and take your times to come home and just like veg out on the couch if you want to um, and know that that's also okay. Um, so I do want to just echo that because, you know, you know, sometimes my, my boss will email me at 11 o'clock at night, and I have, and there's, and there's no reason for me to answer that at 11 o'clock. There's no expectation for me to do that other than if I feel inclined to. So I think setting those boundaries are important, which kind of, I think, is, is like building a connection with, um, like, your supervisor or whoever um, you report to, having that conversation about where your boundaries are, right, and, and everyone being on the same page. I'm lucky enough that um, the person I report to, like, I'm able to tell him, like, I am stressed about this thing here, and um, and he tends to kind of jump. He's like, what can I do? What can I do to kind of help you be less stressful about this? Because I, cause he doesn't want me to, like, burn out and leave just so, and have to, like, replace me. And so I think um, like that's, that's one of the things that, you know, everyone thinks about, like, you know, having to hire someone to come back in and train them and then all the resources you put into been training a new person and going through the job search. And so uh, I think a good supervisor is going to be someone who then, you know, allows you to find those boundaries and helps you kind of balance that life, work life um, kind of um, balance. And so, um, so for me, having an open, maybe have an open relationship with my supervisor where I can tell him, like, this is where I am. This is, I don't want to be crying in my office. So can you, you know, where, because I'm so stressed out. So and he appreciates that and he recognizes that and he does what he can to kind of shoulder some of that or, or kind of move some deadlines and rethink and restructure. And so I think um, that has helped me kind of make sure that I, you know, that I'm in a place that's supporting, supporting me and supporting the work we do and recognize that the work we do is important, but also recognizing that I'm also important. So I think that is an, an important thing to think about when you're looking for a job. I definitely agree with all of those things. Um, I think there's power in learning to say no in certain situations and knowing when those situations are. Um, as Lexi mentioned, it is easy and it's great to kind of come in and be, be excited and say yes to as much as you can, but you need to also just show yourself some grace and know that you are only human and you can't be everything to every person all the time, 100% always. Um, but then also, I something that's helped me is just be mindful of creating healthy habits now as far as eating well and trying to exercise or whatever it is that you personally do to kind of de-stress. Figure out what that is and what works for you and go ahead and make that a part of your daily life because the older you get, the harder it is to incorporate new habits. So if you have those kind of day one, year one in the professional world, those will stick with you and help you kind of maintain that good balance. So this says, what do you do to help take care of yourself working in your current role? Um, so since I'm still a little bit newer to my role, um, so I started this position in late July, 2019, and I was seven months pregnant. And then I had a baby in September, um, late September, 2019. And then I took a stint of maternity leave. And then I came back in late November and am really just now understanding like the full extent of my role. I think for me, just this, this taking care
care of myself during working is just a, a challenging thing currently because I have two kids under age four and a husband who had um, recently finished a master's program and graduated and was unemployed for a brief period before he got his job and I was the only um, like financial stability for our home and I was having to have a baby and start a new career all at the same time and that was very stressful so honestly I feel like I'm, I'm just coming out of the fog of all of that and not doing a great job at taking care of myself um because I work really late nights and I spend a lot of time in um, city council meetings and commissioner meetings and going to Nashville and DC to talk about different ways our elected officials can help support um, opioid and prescription drug legislation. And I think it's just hard. Um, and in fact, I would say to me, self care is one of those like frequently talked about like work life balance things that I think just. Is it bad because I think it's a myth? I don't I don't know if, it, if it's a myth necessarily as much as I think it's impossible to assume that on any given day that you can devote 100% um, of yourself to a job during just X, Y, or Z hours, and then you can go home and also think about taking care of your family. So I think there are some days where, like, I feel like I've really succeeded on the family side, and I've really taken care of myself, you know, physically and mentally, and I've taken well, and and I feel like a good mom, and then there's some, but I feel like a really bad boy. And then all those other weeks where I feel like I'm really killing at my job, like I'm doing a really wonderful job, <laughs> and um, I feel really guilty that I haven't seen my kids in 14 hours. Um, and so I guess all that to say, I think I'm just a work in progress with that, and I hope other folks on this panel have better advice for you because I am not modeling that currently. And I think what Alicia said is valid. I mean, we don't have to get it perfect. And as everyone on the panel has mentioned, like nothing about this is perfect. <laughs> so just being graceful with yourselves when you are going to those situations and trying to take care of yourself as best you can um, is really the best advice that, that we can give. And, and you have to figure that out, that out for yourself. All right. So two more questions. Um, so as we are asking these questions, if any of y'all have questions for the panelists, please send those my way. And I'm happy to ask those. We haven't had any so far, which is okay. Um, which hopefully means that all your questions are being answered as we're chatting. Um, but just know that still is an option. All right. What is something no one told you as you navigated being a young professional that you wish someone had? I'll be glad to start with that one. I think something I wish someone had made me realize is that you can't be too concerned with what other people think about you as far as what you decide to do with your post-college life, as far as what type of job you want to get, um, where you want to go. I know when I came out of school, I felt like the complete loser of my friend group because out of the six of us that are my closest friends, one was going to law school, one got this amazing consulting job, one was traveling abroad for a year, and then I was still kind of wandering around trying to figure out what I was doing. Um, and it took pretty much all of my 20s to figure out that you need to kind of ignore what other people think about your choices because your decisions ultimately affect your own life the most. And you have to kind of just not be selfish about it, but kind of go internal and think about what is it that I want regardless of what other people are saying or telling me that I should do or shouldn't do because everyone has an opinion about everything and they always will and I think once I kind of let that go and started to block out the opinions of others I was able to guide myself a little bit um, and kind of get on track and now I have a career that I love it just took me a while to get there but I think once you stop caring about what other people say or think about you. It's very freeing and it's very liberating. So if you can get there in your 20s, that's great. I'm in my 30s now and I'm finally there a little bit more and it's great, but um, try not to worry too much about what other people think about your decisions. You have to kind of live and build your own life. Um, otherwise you're gonna be making, making decisions based on other people and that's not gonna end up you know, putting you in a happy place. I think for me, um, it's that a supervisor is more important than you think it might be. 
I think that in your first role, you might just be, okay, this is my boss. You know, I have to deal with it as it comes. But I think sometimes the supervisor makes or breaks that role. And I think there's a little bit of like learning that comes with that. But if it's not a good situation, if you're really not being supported by your supervisor, then it's okay to recognize that and look for that in other avenues. I think that was a mistake that I made kind of early on is just thinking that like, oh, it's just my first job. Like this is just something I have to deal with. Um, but I think that you deserve to be happy. And I think a supervisor has a lot to do with that. So just kind of taking your own worth and your value into account when you're existing into a role and really like looking and asking for the things that you deserve. Um, I would say um, one of the things I wish I knew is that you, you build relationships very differently once you move into the job field than you do maybe when you're a student. And thinking and being very thoughtful about the relationships that you're building, and so maybe having a mentor um, who's maybe maybe been in the company for a while that can maybe give you tips on kind of office culture that you may not be aware of. So you may you know you may think, oh, I you know it's not a big deal that I do this because all my friends love it in on my in my free time, but it may not be the same way when you go and work in an office of people relatively. Uh, maybe in the same place that you are. And so I think having someone help guide you those first few years of kind of being a professional, what that looks like, because it is a huge transition from being um, a student and how you build a relationship like me with faculty or in an internship um, or a co-op where there's not necessarily a high expectation of you to be as professional as it is once you actually are a full-time employee. And so thinking about one, how you build a relationship with people um, and being, and then so having, and it's having, looking for someone to help guide you um, to kind of like give you those little extra tips that you may not just pick up from just observing people's behavior in the office, but someone who can actually give you some really helpful things. So even if you can't get that from your supervisor, but maybe someone else in the company and being, being open to asking for that, like asking for that mentor. navigated being a young professional that you wish someone had. Um, I was very grateful to have mentors in my life um, fairly early as a young professional, but honestly, I, I got many mentors outside of higher education um, almost immediately um, since after my first four and a half years working at the University of Tennessee, um, I then exited higher education and even though I did have mentors and people that could guide me on what it means working outside of higher ed um, at that time, I just wish I had built those relationships a little bit earlier. Um, so I think one of the best pieces, pieces of advice I had ever been given was having a board of directors um, kind of kind of given to you, and I think that is really important. So who are those, you know, someone in the ballpark of like three to five people that you feel like you can call and give you different perspectives on professional work life balance guidance um, that will also give you different perspectives right like I don't want to necessarily go and ask five people to serve on my you know board of directors that weren't willing to give me um, very honest sometimes hard feedback um, and I will say at this point like my board is like four-ish people large and I feel comfortable calling them every single time I'm I'm navigating something a little bit hard um so yeah I think my my advice would be find your board of directors as early as possible I mean right out of the gate you need to become a professional because that first role might be for me four and a half years long um it could be longer than that and it could be much shorter than that mm -hmm. I've also had a number of friends that they got in their first position it wasn't at all what they were expecting and they left pretty quickly within a year or under a year sometimes depending on what, what they were doing so I think getting those folks early um, to help guide you would be the best advice I could give you. 
All right. And the final question, thinking back to your college years, what is one piece of advice that you would have given yourself? And would you give that same advice to current students looking maybe to their first job? You know, I know things are kind of odd right now. And, and hopefully that advice holds true. Yeah. Um, well, I say this. Oh, you can go. Oh, Oh, okay. I say this all the time to um, students who come to the Center of Financial Wellness, and I wish that I had done this, and that is starting to save, like just starting to save for my first job, and if, you know, talking to HR about what my benefits are and how I can start, you know, making sure I'm creating that nest egg for myself for, um, you know, for the future, for retirement, for unexpected events, and so, because right now, I think you... The, the biggest asset you have is time. And so, and if that's just, if I wish I had put away more in those earlier stages than I do now, because I think it just is a huge benefit because um, you get, you know, the compound interest on those things and you're able to make sure that you, you're there to, you know, you're able to take care of yourself in the long, in the long haul. So, I would tell I would tell myself that I don't know if I would listen, but I would definitely have told myself that um, that saving and talking to HR and kind of knowing what my benefits really are and what they really mean, I think would have helped me in so many ways that I hadn't didn't think about until I got like you know job three or four. So I think my advice would be take time with a job search. I feel like there's this pressure when you're first kind of applying for that job and you see all your friends around you maybe getting a job or there's an internship that they've done. Um, and so you kind of feel this pressure to apply to a bunch of random ones or take the first job that maybe comes your way. But you do have kind of that beauty of time. Um, and it's not the worst thing in the world if you want to go home, you know, and save some money while you're looking for a job and really finding that right fit for you. So kind of just do what's best for you, but also really do look for a job that's going to kind of connect the dots for you. Um, and that can look like anything. It could be kind of whatever you want to do, but just kind of knowing that it takes the average student about seven months to get a job after graduation. So if it feels like, you know, you're in, you know, the end of your senior year or, you know, it's month one or two, you're still okay. Like you're still on track. There are still students out there who are looking for jobs and there's still companies that are hiring for those jobs. In fact, a lot of companies don't start their hiring until the summer. And so if you're feeling like, okay, I need to get something right away, that might not necessarily be the case and maybe being okay with waiting and taking some of that time to find the right fit for you. Yeah, I definitely agree with all of that. Um, the thing I'll add is try to get away with assist, like your age and how old you are and how long you've been out of school is really just a number and it doesn't really mean anything in the grand scheme of things. So something that I wish I had not done was just associating certain milestones with a certain age of, oh, by the time I'm 24, I'm going to be at this point. And by the time I'm 28, I'll be here. And when I'm 30, I'll have this, this, and this. Because none of that ever works out like you think it's going to ever. And I've never heard anyone say that it does. So if you kind of try to push pause on that thinking, it's going to take a lot of the stress off because I think when you get so wrapped up into trying to figure out what your timeline is going to be, you're missing a lot of other opportunities that may be right in front of you that you're just not seeing. So as much as you can, I would just try to be present and be aware of every opportunity that comes up and at least consider it. Even if you don't think it's what you want to do, don't rule out an opportunity just because it doesn't fit into your timeline. At least consider it. And if it takes you a different way than what you thought, sometimes that's what you need to do. So I would just be okay with kind of being present and don't try to get too wrapped up in planning your whole life out because it will change a million times between now and the next, you know, 30 years before you retire. And then one more final thought from Miss Alicia. And then we have one question too. So excited to share that. One piece of advice you would give yourself. Would you give the same advice to current students going into their first job? Um, so that piece of advice that I would give myself in my college years 
um, would be A, be as involved as you can, which I did feel like I, I modeled in that and I tried really hard to do based on my involvement on campus because I think it helped give me a lot of different experiences to share as I went into my first or to pull from as I went into my first professional position. But then the piece that I was not prepared for as a, a first time professional was it's just going to be so much harder than whatever you can imagine, right? You know, I already had an undergraduate degree and also a master's degree by the time I started my first role, and it it was just so hard. I mean, just the transition from mainly being focused on my academics and then kind of work and things on the side to then being focused on my job performance and the outcomes that were required of me um, for my professional role. Um, it's just a different kind of heavy and a different kind of um, stress and a different kind of, um, I don't know, just require a different kind of self-management than being in actual school did. All right, and I think that may have cut off a little bit, but that's okay. So we do have one question from Catherine. So what are best practices for negotiating job benefits and salary? Um, which we did touch on a little bit in our last Adulting 101. I'll make sure that we can share those with you as well. And then the other question is anything else that you would add on the topic that you haven't mentioned? I think as far as the salary and the kind of benefits negotiation piece, I think the main thing is don't be afraid to do it. Um, especially as women, you, we have to because men do it all the time and we don't. So we need to make sure that we are stepping up and doing the same. I think the most important thing to remember though is that you want to make sure you have reason to do it. You don't, don't do it just because you feel like you should. You want to make sure there's a good reason to be doing it. Either that's that you know the salary is lower than what it should be based on the research you've done, or if it's a situation where you've been in a role for a while, you need to come and show like these are the skills that I've ha I have, these are the things that I've proven, here's why I deserve this raise or these benefits. And even going in as a new candidate, um, even if you haven't worked there before, if you have a lot of experience from an internship or something you've been involved with as a student, during college, the biggest thing is just to make sure you have a reason to justify you asking for that raise and for those benefits. Um, it's a scary thing to do, but I've done it before and it's not as bad as you think it will be. And I'd say nine times out of 10, 10 it works out in your favor. So just don't be afraid to do it. I think another thing to know is you've gotten the job. Um, they've gone through the search. You're the candidate that they want. Um, so I think asking those questions, it's not like they're going to now revoke their job offer. Um, but I also think you need to know when you're asking for that, like if you do have a reason, and even if the salary might be lower, sometimes even asking that question, you're not maybe going to get what you want. It could be that the company does not have the resources or the budget to do that. And um, kind of the same with relocation fees. There, you know, might be a company that does have that, that they can offer. Um, it's always worth it to ask for something like that. But if they say no, know that that doesn't always have something to do with you as a candidate. Sometimes it just might be the budget of the company specifically. Um, and knowing that whether you, if you want the job based on the salary or not, because also they know that going in, you've applied with the salary that they've offered. Um, and so that's also kind of, I think it's just a relationship that you have where you have respect for them um, and they do have respect for you as a candidate. I agree with uh, both of those things. I think thinking about when you ask about the, you know, when you when you go to negotiate, um, it, you know, it's when they offer you the job versus the first meeting you have with the, you know, you come in and you meet with the committee and you, you know, you don't want to be like, oh, so is there any way to negotiate the salary um, when you're meeting with like the search committee? Because that may put uh, them in an awkward position. So thinking about when you ask, um, and I think like what, um, Lexi was saying is that once they offer you the job, you're the one they want, and so they will, um, there's something they consider, but it may not always be salary. Like, there may be other things that you can negotiate that they may not be able, so they may be like, well, in six months or a year, um, then this can, we can kind of reconsider it, but what's important about this is that because a lot of times, like, raises are going to be based on percentages, right, and so if you're already starting at a lower salary, even if you're getting raises, it's always going to kind of be behind that curve if people are getting 
if there's people who are applying for this very similar job who got at a higher pay rate than you, then they're, even though you may get the same percentage, they're always going to, you know, be moving, you know, high, they're raising their salary higher. So it's really, it's really important to be thoughtful about how you ask and when you ask, um, but also recognize what a company can and can't do. And maybe their response to you will tell you about what kind of company they are, right? And it may not even be a place that you'd want to work. Um, and I say to the second part of that question, what I haven't like I haven't said, I think kind of ties in. It's also your opportunity when you meet with, because you may meet with a lot of people during that that search, and it's okay to then so the, so so there may not be people who are going to be making the decision to hire you, but it's also a way for you to kind of get insight into what that company is like or what that office is like, and that's a great time to actually ask those questions about what that culture is like. If you're someone who likes to celebrate and hang out with coworkers and do things um, in the office and you find out that this office doesn't do anything like that. that you're to come in. I had a friend who had a job that they were to come in and and if you were seen talking longer than a couple of minutes, then they were like, what were you talking about? What's going on? You're not. And so they had to like, I am each other secretly because it was really um, a lot of tension around kind of how office may communicate with each other. So I think talking to people in that office and really asking questions about what you want to know about what that office is like. It's going to be, um, I think that's, that's where you kind of get the information from other people who aren't necessarily the hiring person who's going to hire you, but so you can then also do your own um, interviewing with those, with those people. And I would say to you, just to kind of wrap all of this up, I know a lot of our panelists, um, which thank y'all, first of all, you, but all did amazing. Um, I think y'all said this so eloquently that really it is, it's your own path. Um, e each person's job search and each person's situation is very different from one another. And I think that's something important to remember that don't compare yourself to other people because they may have other things going on that you don't know about. And you may have other things going on that they don't know about that are really driving your search. Um, it's not just about getting the job. Um, that's a big part of it and everything that leads up to that, but it's really what happens after. And that's, that's really what this whole panel is about. Um, but again, continue to give yourselves grace, um, with that and be brave and be, excited to take on new adventures and new things. And um, really that's kind of what we wanted y'all to learn from all of this. So thank you guys for bearing with us for an hour and a half. I think this is our longest adulting one-on-one -on -one yet, but I wanted to make sure that we had all this time to ask all the questions. Um, and just really quickly, just wanted to remind all of you who are still on the call. Um, we do have more events from the Center for Student Engagement this week. Um, if you wanna go to calendar.utk.edu backslash VES, that will show you everything that's happening. So stay tuned um, and we hope to see y'all again very soon. So thank y'all and have a great night.